hoping to bring to you tomorrow. Uh, you know, airlines, they're sometimes not on time. Um, so she is a former software developer, current software developer, uh, now a lawyer, and is going to speak about uh, fingerprints, passcodes, and self-incrimination. So please give her a warm schmookon welcome. Hi. Hey, folks. So I'm super excited to be filling in here. Uh, first public speaking I ever did was at Fire Talks a couple years ago. Um, so Shmoo is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about Touch ID, Face ID, and the Bill of Rights, um, and so forth. So I want to start first with how many people here use Touch ID on your phone? How many folks are using the face unlock? Okay. Pretty good number. All right. All of you are definitely going to want to pay attention to all this. <laughs> but I am an attorney. Um, I suffered through law school and the bar, and I'm actually a Washington, D.C. attorney. Um, none of this is legal advice, and I am not your attorney. If you have actual questions about this stuff, EFF has a table out there, and Nate and Kurt are excellent. Um, go chat with them. <laughs> We're going to talk hypos today. So as I said, um, I'm an attorney. Uh, I am an information security counsel uh, at a small tech company out in Washington State. Uh, last year, I was in DC. I did a fellowship at Zvilgen. Uh, before that, I was in law school. And before that, I spent many, many years as a software developer. So let's imagine that you're out at like the Women's March or something, and you get arrested. And the police officer holds your phone up to your face to unlock it and then pops it into a Faraday cage. Does this concern any of you guys? So even if you don't think you have committed any crimes at all, our phones these days have everything. I have my Google Calendar. My entire life can be accessed through my iPhone. Um, and we sh you know, really have to be concerned that some of the information in this phone could be taken and misconstrued. Um, small pieces of it could be used against us. So the Bill of Rights, which is the first 12 amendments to our Constitution, uh, excuse me? 10, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I took the bar last year, so now I've forgotten all this stuff, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about the Fourth and the Fifth Amendments. Uh, this is the Fourth Amendment here, and the important part is this unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, what this basically means is that for almost any search of a house or a computer or so forth, law enforcement needs a warrant. And in order to get a warrant, they have to go before usually a magistrate judge and show some kind of probable cause. Um, this means they have some reason to believe that some kind of a crime has been committed and that they'll find evidence. There are a bunch of exceptions to that. You guys are probably pretty familiar with these stickers. Uh, if you don't have one and you want one, you can go to the EFF table and make a small donation and they will hook you right up. Uh, these uh, stickers basically address the consent exception. You can tell law enforcement, like, yes, you can go search my house. And so people put these on their phone saying, no, I'm not consenting to a search of this device. Uh, there are a couple other uh, Fourth Amendment exceptions out there. Search incident to arrest. If you're arrested, the police can pat you down, look through your bags. Uh, there are plain view, there's some car search ones. Uh, we're going to touch real quickly on Riley versus California, which has to do with cell phones and search incident to arrest. It used to be if you were arrested, police could take your cell phone and send it to a forensics lab and look through it, and they did not need a warrant for this. Uh, the Supreme Court in 2015 said that that uh, search incident to arrest uh, exception was primarily based on officer safety, and a cell phone is highly unlikely to really hurt an officer. And it secondarily had to do with preserving evidence. And they're like, well, but we have Faraday cage bags. Um, so they got rid of that. So now if you're arrested and you have a cell phone on you, uh, the police need a separate warrant in order to look through that cell phone, and especially any cloud-connected services and so forth. This is the Fifth Amendment. This amendment gives you a whole ton of rights. Uh, we're going to focus on the self-incrimination one. That it means that you cannot be required to give testimony in a court case that would show that you committed a crime. And like the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment has a whole ton of exceptions. Because when they give you the bar exam, they love to torture you on these things. So you forget important things like how many Bill of Rights amendments there are. Uh, foregone conclusion essentially means that if the government already knows the information implicit in what you would say or write, uh, that you are not incriminating yourself by essentially repeating it. Uh, there have been a couple of cases on this. Uh, 
I am not even going to attempt to pronounce this case because I will do it incorrectly. Uh, this is a 2012 Colorado district case had to do with mortgage fraud. The defendant was heard talking on the phone to her husband saying, don't worry, all the evidence against us is on my laptop and it's encrypted. And so the court was like, well, okay, now you're unlocking this laptop because foregone conclusion, we know there's evidence on there. Uh, so what does all this have to do with your cell phone and with Touch ID and Face ID? Uh, essentially, courts have interpreted uh, the password and Fifth Amendment thing to mean that if you're putting, typing in a password that this is testimonial, and then if it would reveal evidence that that would be self-incrimination. Uh, self and then biometric unlock comes along and throws a wrench into this, like tech does a lot of times with uh, laws that were written in the 1700s. So Apple devices can be unlocked just by putting your uh, thumbprint down. Uh, there are some Samsung Galaxy S8s that have this. I think there's a couple other phones out there. iPhone X has the face unlock. Uh, and the problem comes down to what you know versus what you are. What you know and what you can say or write or type in as a passcode is considered testimonial and that is protected by the Fifth Amendment, uh, barring things like foregone conclusion and so forth. What you are is something like your fingerprints, your iris pattern, a DNA swab, and so forth. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, found many years ago that compelled exhibition of a body characteristic is not testimonial under the Fifth Amendment. So the act of, although the act of unlocking a cell phone communicates some degree of possession of this phone, and it can be testimonial in the fact that you can say, okay, I have control over this, uh, it's not testimonial in the same way as writing out, like, yes, I did the crime and I did it in this particular way. So yeah, basically we have a big problem with biometric unlocks. Uh, because the biometric unlock is not usually seen as the equivalent to testifying against yourself. It's just seen as, you know, like you have this body characteristic. And it coincidentally unlocks this small magic device that has your entire life in it. Uh, the courts instead like to analogize to giving DNA samples. Um, and they say this is not a search in the Fourth Amendment context. Uh, and they really worry, and this is probably a correct worry, that breathalyzer tests in particular are going to be very impacted if we start recognizing a Fifth Amendment biometric unlock right. Right now, if you're pulled over for suspected drunk driving, you can be required to give a breathalyzer test. Um, because your blood alcohol level will go down within a couple hours, it's very important that police have the right to do this in the field. Um, they do oftentimes try to get emergency warrants. It depends on the state and so forth. Um, but it is kind of equivalent to the biometric unlock, like you breathing into a machine versus you putting your thumb down on the phone. Uh, Oren Kerr has written a lot about this stuff, and he's got what I think is a hilarious take on uh, why biometric unlock is not testimonial. He's like, well, I could just cut your finger off and then take your finger and put it down on the phone. Your finger's no longer connected to you. How can this possibly be testimonial? Uh, the DOJ basically says, Putting your fingerprint on a phone is the same thing as having your fingerprints taken when you're arrested. We've been doing this for like hundreds of years. Like, why are you guys freaking out over this? This is just what we do. And there are starting to be more and more court cases where people are being required to unlock the phones uh, with their fingerprints or so forth. Um, and if not, they're being held in contempt of court. Uh, the problem really is if police don't know what they're going to find inside the phone when they have you do that fingerprint unlock, like that's really a testimonial act. They, it, this is not a foregone conclusion. They don't know that they're going to find text uh, between you and your co-conspirator talking about going and like, you know, robbing a bank or something. So we're gonna loop back to the Fourth Amendment real quick. Uh, I wanna talk about the third party exception. This is another exception to the warrant uh, requirement. It basically says if you've given a piece of information to another party like Google for your Gmail or your bank for some of your banking information and so forth, you no longer have a reasonable expectation of privacy because you know you gave it to a different person and so therefore no warrant should be required. There's also the Stored Communications Act, which is a part of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, uh, which governs all the rules for doing wiretaps and getting stored data and so forth from people like Google, um, T-Mobile, AT&T, stuff like that. And it says, uh, part of it 
so that you don't need a warrant for emails stored on a server over 180 days. This was written in the 1980s when people would dial up, use Pop or whatever to download all their email locally, and you just wouldn't leave email on the server. They didn't have cloud servers. Gmail was like not even a sparkle in anybody's eye at that point. But today, service providers do require a warrant. So what happened? Basically, a lot of things happened, but this court case also happened. Uh, this is Warshak. Uh, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals found that even though people might leave their email up on the servers for a long time now, people do actually have a reasonable expectation of privacy in it. This is not a Supreme Court case. This does not have to be the law all over the entire country. It would only be in the Sixth Circuit, but pretty much every single internet service provider that is remotely you know, privacy protective now requires warrants. We can get into the whole thing later about like how ridiculously easy it is to get warrants, but it's a protection. So what if courts never actually do this kind of shift and start requesting a warrant for uh, biometric unlocks or realizing that this is a Fifth Amendment uh, self-incrimination sort of problem? Uh, one of the things that uh, causes this to be a problem is device security is really good these days. Like Apple Secure Enclave is actually very good technology. Um, it's extremely difficult to get into that uh, phone unless it's been unlocked with your fingerprint or a passcode or so forth. Uh, what happened in Apple versus FBI was essentially that the FBI hacked into the phone that used a security vulnerability. And so a lot of people go like, oh, this is not really a problem. There'll always be a security vulnerability. Like we can always hack into something if we really have to. Uh, so part of this, though, is that using security vulnerabilities in an escape hatch, especially for long term, like it allows people to sort of sidestep these difficult uh, legal and policy debates that we really need to start having as a society about what do we uh, expect in terms of like our rights in the society? What does the Bill of Rights mean in an era where we all have pockets or pocket computers? Um, there are a lot of existing safety features uh, that come into play here. So there's the like tap your power button five times to put your iPhone into distress mode. If you haven't put the, your uh, fingerprint on the phone to do the touch unlock for 48 hours, the passcode is required. If you restart, the passcode is required. Um, on the other hand, this also creates an artificial time pressure for police to get the phones unlocked very quickly. Uh, there are also concerns about destruction of evidence. Um, so on the one hand, we can say that if you have Touch ID enabled on your phone and you tap the button like five times really quickly to put it into the distress mode so Touch ID doesn't work anymore, that's probably not destruction of evidence. All of the data is still on your phone. It can still be unlocked with a passcode. Like yes, now putting the passcode in is by most courts um, seen as testimonial, and so you can claim Fifth Amendment privilege for that. Um, on the other hand, we could say, well, what if you had a duress word that you could say near your phone, and when you said that, it would put the phone into a mode where biometric unlock wouldn't work, and it would delete all the data on the phone, and it would go out to your cloud services and nuke everything there, so like wipe out your Gmail, wipe out your G Drive, wipe out your Office 365 and your OneDrive. That's probably going to be destruction of evidence. <laughs> if you're being arrested and you say this duress word and it goes and wipes out all your cloud data, like they're probably going to charge you with that. But where is the line in between the two of those? Like we have never had this discussion as a society and there are not a lot of legal cases that want to look at uh, where that line is. What this comes down to a lot also is the privacy versus convenience uh, divide. Um, Device manufacturers, and probably rightly so, focus a lot on convenience. They focus a ton on usability. And we do want things to be convenient. Like if you look at the really low numbers of two-factor adoption, probably a lot of that is because two-factor is actually a royal pain in the neck. Um, when I want to get into my Google account, I have to like get up and walk across the room to go find my YubiKey. Like it's kind of annoying. Um, we can have device manufacturers, however, protect our security. Um, by doing maybe a couple more things, they could have like the duress mode that Apple has. Um, people have talked about, well, maybe I should have a duress finger, so if I put that finger on, um, it won't unlock the phone. You can maybe start getting into destruction of evidence uh, sort of things with that, 
but my theory is that as long as you're not actually deleting the data on the phone, you're just making it require a passcode, it's probably not. Um, but again, courts are the correct people to decide this sort of thing. And uh, the courts right now are still seeing fingerprint unlock as the same as just doing a DNA swab or a breathalyzer test. Um, people really use biometric unlock because it's fast and it's simple. All of you guys who raised your hand that you use the face unlock that you use Touch ID, use it because it is a pain in the neck to type a long password into your phone every five seconds. Uh, the self-incrimination issue, really rightly so, is probably the last thing that people are thinking about when they're setting up their Touch ID. And we as a society should probably still allow people to use these awesome new technologies, which honestly are really kind of cool. Like face unlock is really spiffy. It has problems, but like it's cool technology. Um, we need to think about, you know, am I giving up my civil rights here when I do this? But really, people should not have to have that debate with themselves. Like, I actually don't have Touch ID turned on my phone because I am a crazy uh, attorney who worries about civil rights things. But, like, I'm an outlier, and other people should not have to go through this whole thing. I should be able to have Touch ID turned on on my phone and not, you know, worry about the Fifth Amendment issues with this. Um, between balancing usability and new features and civil liberties, the device manufacturers so far really are focusing on usability and awesome new features, which is something as a society we should really encourage. So, kind of wrapping this up here, uh, really enabling the touch ID or the face ID is kind of a risk-based calculation you guys should make. Uh, I assume you guys are all not drug dealers out there. Uh, drug dealers and people going to rob banks, whatever, may not want to enable the face unlock. <laughs> so, I think I have a moment or two for questions, uh, but I want to give out a uh, quick shout out to uh, Alan Friedman, who's right here, encouraged me to do my first ever Schmooze CFP. Thank you. Um, and he's not here anymore, but or today, but Space Rogue also was super encouraging after I did my first fire talk. So thank you, Space. So do we have any questions? How does this apply to the border area protection? Oh, border is like a basically a bill of rights free area. It's a mess. Uh, supposedly you have no Fourth or Fifth Amendment rights coming in. That is like difficulty level super advanced. <laughs> I would recommend <laughs> if they ask you to unlock your phones, like this is my five second version of a talk I give this summer, hold your phone, unlock it, show them it's not explosive, and then immediately relock it. And if they want you to unlock it, you have, an, you being a US citizen, it doesn't apply for a visa or anything, have a right of entry and your devices don't. And I would just be like, okay, like you're taking my phone, it's getting sent somewhere. I'm going to come into the country, probably after being hassled for a couple hours. I am not going to unlock that phone for you. But yeah, the border is, border is very hard right now. <laughs> Yes, probably. You're getting into I'm not a criminal law lawyer. <laughs> I'm going to tell you to go talk to Nate because I'm sure that Nate has a fabulous answer for this. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah, so in my mind, this is kind of like the 48 hours that Apple gives you. Like, if you haven't unlocked the phone after 48 hours, that it will require a passcode. Like, that's something that they're doing to protect you. Although, like I said, it, it kind of creates perverse incentives for law enforcement to, you know, force the person to unlock the phone really quickly, like, get them in front of a court and say, we're going to hold you in contempt of court, like, now, because we have to get this phone unlocked in the next 18 hours. Um, Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Oh, it deletes the data? If you haven't put your passcode in in a certain number of days? I don't know that that would be destruction of evidence. I mean, I would hope you weren't hit by a car and in a coma and in a hospital and then, you know, wake up three months later and have just lost all of your email. <laughs> I mean, here's the problem with a lot of, none of these solutions really are going to be 
perfect until a court recognizes that the fact of putting your finger on a cell phone can be testimonial. Like, that, in my mind, is the correct fix, and that's the one that we don't really have right now. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Stop. I have been told, oh, can I? Okay, last question. Uh, I use my Apple Watch to unlock my MacBook Air. Um, in my mind, that's actually pretty good because it's actually fairly secure, the talking that it's doing. It only works if I've unlocked my watch. And the watch doesn't right now necessarily know it's on me. It has to be unlocked and not a person. It will probably be on me because my threat is at whatever. Like, no one really needs to get into my laptop. Um, and so in my mind, that kind of thing is actually pretty good. I like the you know smart tokens being nearby each other. But like again, in my mind, the correct fix is to recognize that this is a testimonial act if it's going to, un like, it has to be fundamentally different between creating an impression of a fingerprint on a cardboard card and unlocking a device that has everything with your life in it. Like, that has to be the important part. So I think I'm out of time. Um, I will be hanging around all weekend. Uh, come talk to me. I love talking about this stuff. And thank you very much. <laughs>